Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so let's get into the arthritis. So um, there are three main types of arthritis that we go over for chronic musculoskeletal. There's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout. And gout or gouty arthritis is considered a type of arthritis um, or gout issues can lead to arthritis, um, bone breakdown and stuff like that. So um, it's definitely helpful. This is another one kind of like the different types of back pain that it's really helpful to make a table and somewhere along here, I have an activity in class that we're going to do. Where we're going to make a table together to start breaking these down. But the big thing, start breaking these things down. Um, the big thing as we're getting into arthritis is, is just starting to look at what's different. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's the same. A lot of the teaching and the treatments might be similar, but what are those subtle differences? Um, so first let's talk about osteoarthritis and osteo, um, you know, means like bone. Um, and by the way, if I ever say something and you look it up and you're like, she was wrong. Um, I really truly intend everything I say to be true. And anything that I'm saying might not, um, uh, what do you call it? when anything that I'm like like don't think that I'm lying about the content but just if I say like this is like a you know like random statistic or you know like osteo means bone um, I'm using my best judgment but um, I am no uh, medical terminologist and I am also um, you know no st statistician oh that is a word that's a fancy word um, but I do my best and it sure sounds like it should mean osteo means bone or you in your head, you can say osteo means bone. So um, it's a bone arthritis. So it's a bone issue. So you want to think about this is a type of arthritis that's a bone issue. And what the issue is here is, is that there's a loss of your articular cartilage or your cushion. So kind of think of this like degenerative disc disease where you lose your cushion. Um, this is similar, but it's going to be in different joints. It's not in your, um, and you can have arthritis in your spine. So it could be there too. But um Needless to say, some things that make this different is this is a bone issue and we're going to talk about it. What pretty much happens is that normally between like, let's say it's like um, your knee joint, like between your two, the top bone and the bottom bone, there's a cushion in between. But what happens with osteoarthritis is that bone gets broken down and it gets broken down, um, uh, you know, just usually because of too much strain, injury, um, you know, frequent um, movement or use of that joint, um, sometimes hormonal changes. And what happens is that then ends up like there's bone on bone and it's just rubbing against um, the other bone. It's very painful and can lead to um, like a decrease of ability to do, you know, basic day-to-day -day activities. Um, some important things to note is this is not an inflammatory joint problem. Now, a lot of people struggle with this because they're like, oh, but I have a family member who has osteoarthritis and their joints get swollen. Um, inflammation can happen sometimes with osteoarthritis, but it's not the typical pattern. Like sometimes just the bone on bone process can lead to some inflammatory issues, but this, um, the problem in osteoarthritis does not start with inflammation. It starts with the loss of that joint cushion. Uh, so this is not like most people think, oh, arthritis, um, it's because of age, like age is a risk factor. Um, it is associated like the older you get the higher chance. Like I think there's something in your new textbook that said like by the time you're, I want to say by the time we're 50 or 60 or something like that, 50, I want to say by the time we're 50, 50% 50 of, um, you know, Americans or somebody have arthritis. Um, something, some crazy high percentage. Um, so like there's a real, like most people in their life at some point are going to have some form of arthritis. Um, but it is not like considered like, oh, you know, it's a result of the age stuff. There's other risk factors. So in other words, like it happens more often the older you get, um, but it's not the age necessarily is the main factor. Um, the risk factors we do see are people that have hormonal changes. We also see those that um, are obese again, because this is, um, we're going to talk about this, but this is usually in your weight bearing joints, um, like your hips and your knees. And so the excess pressure is going to be part of the reason that they can lose that joint cushion. Um, also professional sports, um, or, um, you know, anytime, of course, being a nurse, something where we're doing repetitive activities like, um, kneeling and stooping also puts us at risk. Um, there's others as well, but those are some of the big ones. Let's see if I can advance my slides. All right, so what are our priority assessments? Our main thing that we assess for is pain and or stiffness, because these are the two big things with all types of arthritis is, is that um, generally with most arthritis, they hurt when they move, but if they rest for too long, they get stiff. 
Um, so um, it's a really fine balance with these patients where we want like kind of like with back problems where we want them to move enough so they don't get stiff, but not move so much that they're hurting too much. Um, so we're going to do some specific assessments when it comes to arthritis. Um, these are really key. So you want to pay attention to these um, because as I'm talking about these priority assessments, these are also helping to differentiate what's different between the different kinds of arthritis. So um, first, uh, one of the first questions you want to see is where's the problem? Because this is a lot of what can tell us about uh, most likely what type of arthritis it is. Um, is it on one side of the body or is it bilateral? So in osteoarthritis, you're going to see um, more commonly um, a one, one side of the body is affected where when we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, it's usually bilateral. Um, so in other words, like people generally, when they have osteoarthritis, they're like, oh, I have osteoarthritis in my right hip or my left knee. It's not like I have it in my knees, in my hips. Now, it's not to say that you can't, um, but just more often, it's usually on one side versus the other. Um, and a lot of times it starts on one side, they fix the one side, and then they get it in the other. But um, it's usually one-sided. Um, and then uh, we also want to see which joints, if it's their hips, their knees, like the weight bearing joints or the joints that really support majority of our body weight, um, then it's usually going to be osteoarthritis. Now, I think your book does talk about that for men, like hips and knees is more common in osteoarthritis, but for women, it's like certain joints in their hands. So this can happen in the hands too. But usually when we talk about osteoarthritis, we're thinking hips and knees. When we talk about rheumatoid, we're thinking of the small joints like in the hands and the feet. Um, so um, we're one-sided on the weight-bearing joints. And then something that is specific to osteoarthritis is what's called crepitation or grating sensation. I described this a little bit when I was talking about um, when I was turning a patient that had a fracture and their bones were grinding up against, grinding sounds weird, grating up against each other and um, like the broken bones were rubbing against each other. And so um, as a result of that, it, it left with this really strange sensation. It's like a bone on bone. The same thing can happen. They, we especially find this in patients with knee osteoarthritis that um, like if you're, if like, if you do range of motion on their knee and have your hand on their knee, you can actually kind of like feel like vibrations from the, the grinding of the two bones together. Um, and sometimes you can actually hear it. Um, it's, it's pretty, um, it's a pretty gnarly sound. Um, so there's that. Um, there's crepitation. That is something specific that you're only going to see in osteoarthritis um, because it's a bone on bone. Remember, osteo is bone issue. Um, you want to assess the joint itself. Well, you know, is it um, inflamed, edematous? Um, is it warm to touch? Because this is a lot of what's going to differentiate. Remember, osteoarthritis is not an inflammatory arthritis. And so um, we're going to note that um, usually the joint, it, you know, there again, they can have some inflammation, um, but it's not going to be the same as it is with rheumatoid arthritis, which we're going to see like a very, um, a much more swollen, um, warm, inflamed joint. And then also when we talk about gout, um, we have differences in color of the joint and we also have like very, um, a lot of tenderness there. Now, all these people are going to have pain, but um, yeah, it's going to vary a little bit about what makes their pain happen um, and a little bit of like how these joints actually, actually look. Um, something else that is specific to osteoarthritis is um, going to be what are called Bouchard's and Heberden's nodes. Now, these are found on the hands, and they're like bony overgrowths. Um, and um, what, um, you know, effectively, like, in other words, if someone has Bouchard's nodes, Heberden nodes, um, it is a very high chance that they have osteoarthritis. Not everyone with osteoarthritis gets them, and they don't have to have arthritis in their hands to get these nodes. Um, so it's not necessarily like, hey, you know, um, you know, this is arthritis in the hands. It's just it's a bony overgrowth as a result a lot of times of um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the the breakdown or the loss of cushion and things like that. So. Needless to say, um, if you know, like, this is one of those things that can help differentiate. This is definitely something like, it'd be great on your note card to make like a little table and put like, okay, um, you know, like, you know, all of each of these things, like joints that are affected, one-sided or bilateral, um, what's different, you know, the, the crepitus, um, Bouchard's, Heberden's nodes, like really starting to um, make it simple so that you don't have to remember every little last detail. Um, 
because you know in real life you know it, like this is the hard thing this is that we do have to kind of test you over some of these differences so you can help see these things but in, I mean in real life you can't remember every disease process you can't remember every last symptom and you know sometimes there's something that will come to me and I'll be like I remember learning something about this in nursing school but um yeah needless to say um, you just want to, you want to try to think big picture, but, um, you want to like what I ideally as an instructor would like for you to do is use the note card to remember more like basic knowledge or things that you need to refer to. Whereas like more like big picture priorities, taking care of patients. That's what I want you to really ingrain in your head versus, um, the, um, like random numbers or things like that. Um, and then the other thing that we're going to do to help differentiate is look for presence or absence of systemic symptoms. So for a patient with osteoarthritis, it's just a bone on bone issue. There's no other, um, you know, systemic disease going on. But when we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, this is a autoimmune disease that can affect every organ in your body. So they have a lot of times systemic symptoms or other general symptoms, whereas osteoarthritis, it's usually just the, um, uh, just the joint issues. So other questions you might want to ask, um, does your pain get worse with activity? Something else that's specific to arthritis is does your pain get worse with weather changes? And this is like, you know, um, we call them barometric changes. I think. Um, and um, I'm pretty sure that's the word for it. Um, but, you know, a lot of times people will say like, oh, like, you know, like their arthritis is like, hey, I know a storm's coming because my knee is hurting or something like that. Um, and then we want to ask them about stiffness after resting. If they, um, most patients with arth, uh, with osteo or rheumatoid arthritis are going to have what's called morning stiffness because they've been laying in their bed all night. Um, but does it get better after 30 minutes or is it prolonged? If it's prolonged, it's more likely that they have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, whereas if it's, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, it gets better after about 30 minutes. Once they get up and get moving, it's usually osteo. Now keep in mind, I've given you a lot of little things here. It's not that we can do one thing. Like they say, Ooh, I don't have prolonged morning stiffness. And we're like, boom, osteoarthritis. Like we're not going to just do it by their assessment, but a lot of this can give us some good information, um, to help us to, um, help this patient. So these are the Heberden, um, Heberden's notes, Bouchard's notes. I have them, I think on the next slide too. Um, but the way that I remember these is the Heberden's are the joint here near the, um, the nail. So I always say they're hanging at the end or a hang nail. Um, and then Bouchard's are the nodes that are in between or here more in the, um, what do you call it? The center of the hand. So you can maybe see it better here. The Bouchard's nodes are in between the hand and the um, fingertip and the Heberden's are hanging at the end. <laughs> Let's talk about um, diagnostic testing because this is going to be another important thing to do um, because, again, symptoms alone um, only tell us so much, but we're really looking for the absence of certain things when it comes to osteoarthritis and um, uh, we caught um, what uh, we caught some other things that might help and kind of collectively we're ruling out that it's not other types of arthritis or other problems and trying to bring together some evidence to best diagnose this patient. Not us as the nurse, but the doctor. Um, but some tests that you would expect for this patient is they may get x-rays. Now, x-rays are not a perfect measure or diagnosis um, that you can't look at an x-ray and be like, oh, this person has really bad arthritis. Um, I always tell the story of my father-in-law who had like a bad hip and a bad knee. They were doing x-rays and they were like, oh my goodness, like we need to um, get this uh, hip. Well, I want to say they said like, we need to get his, one of them replaced. I want to say his hip, they're like, oh, we need to get your hip replaced. How are you even walking right now? He's like, oh, my hip doesn't hurt at all. He's like, my knee though, it's killing me. Um, and they looked and they're like, oh, your knee pictures don't look that bad. So you can't look and be like, oh my God, there's no joints. Like, um, like you can see here, um, there's reduced joint space in this. Like you could look at that and be like, oh, there's no joint space. I bet that's so painful. Um, but it, you really just have to ask the patient how they're doing with it. Cause you know, it's amazing what bothers some people and doesn't bother others. Um, but what we will look on, um, these x-rays for is what's are called osteophytes. They're the kind of like also known as bone spurs that happen, um, over in, um, uh, like, you know, a lot of times kind of like these bony projections. Um, you're only going to see those usually in osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid. Um, so it's a more telltale of a osteoarthritis issue. Um, and then, like I mentioned, there's, uh, narrowed joint space. Cause remember we're lost our cushion. So there's less space cause that cushion has gotten very, very thin or non-existent non-existent. Um, so again, it might kind of help us, but it's only going to tell us so much.
They also want to um, pretty much rule out that there's no signs of inflammation. Now, during an acute arthritis flare-up, when I say flare-up, like they come and go, because arthritis is more kind of like chronic, always with you, where we talk about rheumatoid, it comes and goes. But what I mean more is, is that like, let's say that you're having like a rough episode or a rough time um, with one of your joints for osteoarthritis. Um, some of these might be mildly elevated, but generally, perfect nursing school world, um, for a patient with osteoarthritis, their ESR and CRP, which I'll talk about what those are in a second, should not be elevated because this is not an inflammatory problem. So we have two labs. One's called ESR. It's erythrocyte sedimentation rate. The other is CRP or C-reactive protein. And both of these um, tell us that there's inflammation going on somewhere in the body. It doesn't tell us that there's arthritis. It doesn't tell us where the inflammation is, just that there's inflammation somewhere in the body. Um, so we're going to utilize these um, just to let us know, hey, there's a, some problem, there's an inflammatory problem in the body. Now, if they have osteoarthritis, these should not be elevated because this is a bone on bone issue, not a um, like systemic inflammation issue. Um, so it does help us somewhat to kind of get the differentiation. The other thing that we can do that is more invasive, so it's not necessarily something we do all the time, but um, we will go and actually aspirate fluid from the joint space. Um, it's also known as synovial fluid. And what we would expect to see here is it will be clear. Um, clear uh, synovial fluid is means that there is no issues in the synovial fluid. There's no inflammation happening at the joint, which again, for osteoarthritis, we would not expect inflammation at the joint. We talk about rheumatoid arthritis, there can be inflammation um, or inflammatory particles found in that synovial fluid. So better or worse, there. Um, this is chronic pain and stiffness is mo the big issue. So less pain, less stiffness, um, you know, improved range of motion, improved ability to take care of themselves. It's worse if there's more pain or stiffness or worsening range of motion or movement um, or a decrease or inability to complete those daily activities. Um, this is a chronic condition, so we want to make sure we're um, we're managing their symptoms and improving their quality of life. Um, the biggest focus for osteoarthritis is going to be the pain management. So um, NSAIDs um, are going to be that one of the main ones used. You may be wondering, well, if it's not inflammatory, why are they using NSAIDs? And NSAIDs are just shown to be more effective, especially with joint pain. Um, so remember all the teaching around NSAIDs, um, that it's going to be stuff like we're concerned about GI bleeding, take them with food, um, you know, don't take them with other things that could cause them um, to bleed. And um uh, what do you call it? Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to add there. I think those are the main things. Uh, I think the only other one I was going to say is just if it's aspirin, which, you know, we usually use. Sorry, I'm hearing strange noises. Um, what do you call it? Usually um, aspirin isn't as recommended as it used to be. We use more general like NSAIDs like ibuprofen over aspirin. But um, if you're... Um, uh, if you are doing aspirin, remember that it can get toxic, like ototoxic and things like that. Also remember NSAIDs and aspirin are hard on the kidneys. Um, so just kind of watching kidney function. Uh, there's also topical products. Now we've gotten into some, uh, you know, a new world that has a lot of the, you know, CBD oil products and different creams and stuff like that. But there's a lot of topical creams. Now we are not up to date in our textbook with CBD oil. So there will be no questions on your test about that, at least in my school. Um, but you will know about capsaicin. And if you don't know what capsaicin is, it's um, very similar if you've ever used Icy Hot. Um, so effectively what it does is it's a topical treatment for pain. Um, it can be very useful um, when used regularly and used appropriately. But one thing to keep in mind is that like, if you've never, like God, I hope you have never had my experience where I used Icy Hot and then touched my eyeball. Uh, I will never forget that moment on um, that day. But um, keep in mind with um, other things to consider with capsaicin is, is that, uh, you know, what some people do is they apply this cream and then they want to use other alternative pain management like heating pads. If you put Icy Hot or the capsaicin on and then apply a heating pad, you can end up getting yourself a straight shot to a acute burn. Like, you know, it is not, not something you want to get yourself involved in or doing. Um, so definitely want to um, be super cautious and make sure they know not to use those together at the same time. They can like, it's not that they can never use a heating pad, but they shouldn't put the capsaicin on and then put a heating pad on. Um, there's also um, the uh, the injections that can be used, the corticosteroid injections, um, and those can help just depending on, you know, the severity and stuff. 
Um, those are, um, those can be used like shorter, longer term, like sometimes they can last for a while, just depending. Uh, physical therapy is also very helpful. This is, you know, I had um, my risk factor for osteoarthritis um, since I am still pretty young, but I it was that middle school school story that a uh, little, I could talk middle school story I was telling y'all or alluded to in another video where I tore my ACL. And so, and when I was a teenager, I did not keep up with my exercises and physical therapy. I did get it fixed. Um, but as a result, I never really fully, I don't know if it fully healed properly, um, but as a result, I have some early arthritis. And so I've been through a lot of this. Um, the NSAIDs definitely help and the topical stuff helps. Um, but what I started with, cause I, when I went to the orthopedic doctor, I was like, I don't want any sort of surgery or invasive stuff. I'd like, cause they even offered the steroid injections. They said, it'll probably work. You're young. I'll probably work a long time. And I was like, yeah, let's, can we do something else first? And that's where, you know, I did the physical therapy. And like I said, it, um, you know, they helped my knee by really working on my, you know, quadriceps or my um, thigh, my hip muscles, my butt muscles, and getting those strong to support my weak, uh, weak knee, I should say, I was gonna say weak knees, but it's still just the one. Um, <clears throat> they can make a big difference. Um, later on, if things get worse, like um, like with my father-in-law, they do consider joint replacement just to, um, you know, to help with the day-to-day -day life and also help with functionality, because this can get to the point where they lose a lot of functionality in their day-to-day. Um, as the nurse, one thing that I'm going to focus on is protecting the joints and safety of a person with osteoarthritis. It's going to depend on which joint is having the problem, but I want to teach them good body mechanics, safe home environment, because I don't want them falling, having falls. They're going to be more likely with stiff or painful joints to have a fall. So I want to make sure that I remove things that could get in the way, um, rails um, to have something to hold on to, night lights for good night, uh, lighting so you don't fall and the right kinds of shoes. And then we really want to protect the joints and um, conserve energy. So like the best things that we can do, especially for these joints that are effective is we want to avoid something that's very forceful movement or very repetitive. Um, it, it can definitely cause strain. So I'm um, like when I'm teaching, I try to change my positions pretty regularly and not to put too much pressure. Um, uh, what do you call it on my, on my joints and, um, you know, take turns in different, um, uh, in sitting and standing and walking and moving around, stuff like that. Uh, make sure that they know how to, that they're, they know it's okay to ask for help, um, pacing themselves and, you know, modifying their work at home as needed. Um, overall, other education is going to be balancing rest and activity, um, keeping everything in a functional position, like which might be like, you know, hey, they might need um, knee braces or splints, things like that might help depending on where their arthritis is. Or um, this will also maybe help some people wear um, splints on their hands if they do get arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis in their hands. Um, and then, you know, not being afraid to utilize, um, a, you know, excess, uh, other um, ad adaptive or assistive equipment to help to decrease the stress. So especially if they're going through a rough time or their joints are extra stressed, like using a cane walker and crutches, which a lot of people struggle with accepting that extra help, um, but it's going to decrease the stress on that joint. Um, weight reduction can help too, because remember, it's all about pressure on these weight bearing joints um, for avoiding that repetitive movement, the prolonged standing, kneeling and squatting. Um, heat is really good for stiffness. Now your book specifically mentions that you're not going to see ice used as much because it's not as like an inflammatory condition. It can be used sometimes, um, but you're going to see more often people with arthritis using heat because it really helps with that stiffness. Um, the ice is more if there's like an acute inflammation or issue. And then preventing osteoarthritis as the nurse, I can tell people to avoid smoking. This kind of goes back to the whole thing I was talking about with spinal injuries and smoking affecting circulation. So I want to tell people to avoid smoking um, as it is a risk factor, um, prompt treatment of joint injuries, not putting it off, doing their physical therapy like I um, and keeping up with their exercises like I should have. Um, healthy weight balance diet makes a big difference too, um, as this is all about the extra pressure on these joints. Um, general safety measures, because if you're falling down, you're more likely to have an injury. Um, and regular exercise to strengthen and keep yourself um, uh, in shape and uh, uh, less likely to have bigger injuries. All right. So let's um, do a activity real quick. It says, for each of the following prescriptions, indicate whether it is indicated, contraindicated, or unnecessary for a client with osteoarthritis. So first one is strict bed rest. So, um, you know, it may seem like, cause a lot of times I think people get confused with 
um, joint issues and think, oh my goodness, these people, they don't need to be moving. They're hurting. But again, remember staying in bed and not moving can actually make things worse because they get super stiff. So um, with patients with osteoarthritis, strict bed rest, I would say is actually contraindicated or C um, because it, because remember with this kind of question, indicated means it helps, contraindicated means it hurts and unnecessary means it does not actually do anything to help with this specific problem. So for contraindicated, uh, excuse me, for strict bed rest, it would be contraindicated because it can actually make their symptoms worse. Like, is it making it better, worse, or not changing anything? Um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. This is indicated. It is a good thing. We want them to um, get moving and to start to, um, you know, really um, move, uh, get stretching and uh, move those joints. Um, yoga and stuff can help too. Increase fluid intake. So if they have more fluid, would it help their arthritis? Well, is this a fluid issue? There's no dehydration here. There's no, um, you know, issue with uh, like them building up some sort of particles where they need to like, you know, dilute it. So to me, this is just going to be in the middle, unnecessary. Oh, you can't see my thumb, but it's in the center. Unnecessary. So we have contraindicated, indicated, and unnecessary so far. Heat packs is needed. Heat helps with stiffness. So it's a good one. Uh, morphine, two milligrams IV push, Q2 hours. So most people would say, oh, this is indicated, but I would actually, and I wouldn't say it's contraindicated, but it's usually unnecessary. Um, these patients don't normally end up needing for their arthritis specifically um, the um, high opioids. Most of the time they can be managed. They may be managed with some oral opioids, but IV push morphine for arthritis is not usually needed. Now, maybe when they're having surgery, other things, um, it's possible, but not in day-to-day -day arthritis care, um, most patients are not going to be receiving morphine for their arthritis. So I'm going to say unnecessary. Um, strict intake and output. Well, this is more of a joint mobility issue. There's not really, you know, urine. It's not like the spinal issues where they can have um, bowel and bladder complications. It, it's more just about, it's usually the weight bearing joints like the hips and the knees. So um, keeping a close eye on their strict eyes and O's, it's really unnecessary. It's not going to hurt if you do it, but it's not going to necessarily, it's not, there's nothing about that information that's going to tell me something that I'm going to need to do to change their care. Um, smoking cessation counseling. Absolutely. That is indicated because it can help to um, improve their pain and improve their disease process. Consult to a nutritionist for healthy diet counseling. This is indicated. So healthy diet can lead to weight loss if that's indicated. Um, and, um, uh, that can definitely help with that. Or if they have, like maybe if they have other comorbid conditions like osteoporosis, they can learn the right foods to eat in order to um, prevent complications and falls and stuff. All right, that was osteoarthritis. I'll see you next for rheumatoid.